Awesome. Greetings and welcome everyone. And we're mm -hmm. glad to have you in our first webinar of the 2021-2022 academic year. Uh, this is the Global Black Studies webinar series. And this webinar is co-sponsored by the Office of Intercultural Affairs, uh, the Latinx Studies Program, as well as the Office of the Chief Diversity Officer. So I wanna welcome everyone here. And I first want to acknowledge the Eastern Band of the Cherokee because it is their space that we are guests in. So uh, much respect uh, to them uh, for allowing us to occupy their space. Uh, and today we have a discussion with Dr. Eddie Bonilla on the intersections of black and brown power movements. Uh, and Dr. Bonilla is a uh, postdoctorate fellow, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pittsburgh in Latinx studies and history. Uh, and he earned his PhD at Michigan State University. Uh, so welcome, Eddie, and how are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me, Dr. Watson. And it's it's nice to share space with a fellow Spartan in the room. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, so first, tell us a little bit uh, about your research. I know you're working on a book manuscript. Uh, so we'll start there with you telling us. Oh, before I begin, I'm sorry. If anyone has any questions, put it in the Q&A. Uh, and then I'll read the question to our distinguished uh guest today so with all yeah. that being said <laughs> yeah so i'm first welcome to everybody and i appreciate just the the amount of folks in attendance it's always great to see that number um, especially with so much virtual discussions and how easy it is we're all zoomed out after a year and a half and so i appreciate everybody sharing space today um but yeah I, i'm def i'm currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled uh, homegrown communists multiracial politics and socialist revolution uh during the age of reagan and so it predominantly looks at uh activists that originally began as cultural nationalist activists in the black power movement um prominent figures such as amiri baraka um, as well as uh, folks that came out of the Chicano movement, which was a, a movement also around cultural pride, uh, self-empowerment, um, and kind of the folks started organically moving towards Marxism-Leninism, which uh, what I argue is that communism has been one kind of example of a meeting point for Black activists and, and uh, Latino activists to utilize a common kind of political language to create solidarity and also they're influenced by decolonization movements in Africa, in Latin America. And so this, this period known as quote unquote, the new communist movement is when activists are looking at, you know, Fidel Castro in Cuba, or they're looking at uh, Mao in China and other kind of big Amilcar Cabral and so many other third world revolutionary thinkers. And so what I'm interested in is how they were born and raised in the United States and came to have an understanding that their communities needed change, structural change. And so part of what we can talk about is just kind of the same structures that oppress uh, Black people in the Americas are also oppressing Latino peoples as well, as well as Asian Americans um, is another element that I talk about in my work because many Asian American activists were influenced heavily by the Black Panther Party, um, and they too uh, eventually moved towards Marxism Leninism. So an organization that I write about is called the League of Revolutionary Struggle, which what they wanted to do is to become a new multinational, multiracial communist party, separate from the Communist Party USA that we all know and love from, well not love, but we all know about from uh, folks like Robin D.G. Kelly, scholars like Mika Makalani and others that talk about how activists in the 30s, 40s um, utilize the Communist Party for their own, again, also local social movements. And so I see my work kind of as a pushing of that periodization to get us to think about the 70s and 80s of communist activists and how they were still around. They were, you know, they were foiled by policing and Cointel Pro and the, the FBI. And so trying to put all of that together to get us to understand how we get into 
the 1990s and even into the present moment, many of the activists I write about um, are now leaders in, in movements such as the Black Lives Matter movement in environmental justice activism. And so really trying to see how they're long distance runners. They started activism in the 60s and you know the 60s didn't, they ended, but historians like to focus on that kind of good 60s moment. And I think we ignore what those activists continue doing up until the present moment. So I'm just trying to kind of lend my pen to those voices and hopefully get us thinking about how these activists join these new movements that they're a part of today. And so really trying to contextualize all of that, you know, change over time, how these activists have also changed their strategies um, from being Marxist-Leninist communists to being nonprofit organizers and being, you know, leaders today and some of them being in academia as well, because ethnic studies, I, I hope we can talk about the, the important role of ethnic studies today, because that's for me where the story really starts. And so, um, many of those folks are still now professors in history or they're professors in ethnic studies and they're still shaping even his disciplines uh, of knowledge as well in the present. Awesome, awesome. And shameless plug, I'm teaching introduction to black studies this semester and I approach it as a historical study of the genesis of black studies as well by default of ethnic studies mm -hmm. as well I'm te as, as well I am teaching uh, a history of black Marxists in the US. So everything you just said is actually, you know, a lot of my lectures uh, mm -hmm. this semester to be quite honest with you. Uh, something that you said that I think is uh, very important and I would like to start there uh, with the 60s uh, and the birth of the black power and brown power movement. And I would like to start with the youth. Uh, and and get your thoughts on uh, the best way I can frame this is uh, roots that certain some aspects that were theorized by the people we're discussing as the lumpen proletariat uh, in those movements. Uh, some people will just reduce them to street gangs, but I, I don't. I think it's more nuanced than that. And with the recent movie uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Right. Uh, they 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 talked a little bit about that aspect, but if we study the Black Power movement in places like California, Illinois, we see that the uh, and New York, uh, which are hot beds for the intersections of Black and Brown already, mm -hmm. based on demographics, you know uh, th those street movements played a part uh, in developing that. So, uh, did you see any correlation in your research uh, with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, first and foremost, the the role of the Black Panther Party can't be you know minimized. It really was a movement, right, led by leaders like Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, and then in Chicago, people like folks like Fred Hampton, who recognized that you know these Black Brown coalitions needed to exist. Also, I, I want to speak a little bit, um, perhaps later, about the, these Black Asian coalition and these Afro Asian coalitions because. In a lot of ways, when we think about blackness, blackness means authenticity in, in culture too, right? In hip hop and uh, music and, and just so many parts of our lives, even though there's a lot of anti-blackness that occurs in society. Um, so that, you know, the co-opting of language, the co-opting of music, of songs, but yeah, to speak to kind of the youth of the sixties is that there was a, a significant break as far as, you know, the word Chicano is actually a term that used to be derogatory but these youth activists and in high school movements, there in, in the Chicano movement, there was a lot of these things called blowouts in the in East Los Angeles, where high school students walked out demanding everything as basic as you know Mexican food in the cafeterias to demanding um, counselors that look like them, that talk like them, um, and the changing of curriculum as far as what they're actually being learned in school. And and there's a long history here, right? That both black and brown folks were segregated um, through the Jim Crow period. And, and in Latino history, we kind of talk about it as the Juan Crow, Jaime Crow period, because a lot of times when you saw segregation signs, you would see, you know, no N-word, no Puerto Rican, no dogs um, at that same moment. And so um, many of the youth of the 60s began pushing back on this, right? We have Brown versus Board of Education that de desegregates schools because we know it, it was a slow process, but 
the role of, of the Black Panthers who were coming out of the lump and proletariat or these, you know, not so much the working class, but the, the poor working class, essentially, um, folks that were in and out of jail, perhaps drug usage. And there's a similar narrative to the Young Lords Party um, in Chicago, which uh, the Judas and the Black Messiah movie does it a little bit of their history, which I think that was one of the big critiques of the movie that it ignored the Rainbow Coalition, which was a moment where uh, Fran Hampton in Chicago starts working with this, the Young Lords who are this Puerto Rican group of first generation, second generation arriving uh, migrants from Puerto Rico who were you know, placed into track schooling where the school counselors wanted to only put them right into industrial type of uh, paths um and kind of ignoring the college path for them and so um the young lords were worked very closely with the panthers and they joined in what was the first rainbow coalition which was the black panthers the young lords and then the young patriots i believe which is a, a predominantly white group out of appalachia and so you know the film kind of gets it in a little bit but yeah the young lords were coming out same thing it originally starts as a street gang in chicago and uh Eventually, some leaders, uh, Chacha Jimenez and others, decide to make it a political party. And the same thing happens in New York City as well, um, because there was Puerto Rican gangs that were trying to defend themselves from, you know, what is it, the vice or the vice lords, I guess, were, were in Chicago, but a yeah. couple of the black gangs in, in New York City. And so a lot of the truces that happened there, and we could even think of like Africa Bambada and, and, and the hip hop scene. That's what I was going to say. There's famous, and I showed it in my history of hip hop class. There's famous footage where they had that summon in the school gymnasium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the biggest black gang at the time was the Black Spades. And that mm -hmm. became the backbone of the Zulu nation. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and, and, and that truce, right? And, and prior into that political consciousness or class consciousness in many ways, you know, the, 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 the infighting and rivalries between those groups who were in similar uh disparaging and oppressed positions right and, and that's i think key right is that the, the same structures of capitalism and u.s imperialism are affecting everybody globally right whether we talk about even soviet imperialism or we talk about u.s imperialism um that's why a lot of these folks really start looking you know the black panthers and other activists like miri baraka are traveling to fidel castro's cuba and so we see there just kind of these, these relationships of Black American activists like Robert F. Williams seeking refuge in Cuba and then later seeking refuge in, in China. And so just the way that all of these internationalist movements are intersecting with domestic activism is, is really a significant part of the story. Indeed. And, and keeping with our theme of, of youth and students, uh, Let's talk a little bit more about curriculums mm -hmm. and, and then the push for ethnic studies uh, starting at San Francisco State College then in the third world strike, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so uh, what types of curriculums will start with high school students? And I'm now I have to finish the uh, revisions on a chapter where I talk about black high school students in Detroit who pushed for a black studies curriculum in Detroit public schools, 1969 and 1972. Uh, but tell us a little bit about uh, Chicano Latinx students and the types of uh, curriculums they envisioned in their local K through 12 education first. Yeah, it was very, you know, we have to think about even today, right? That how K through 12 is education is shaped by different states at different levels. National curriculum is one thing, but you know, that just leads to testing. But what many of the youth were fighting for were narratives, particularly in history, that didn't treat them as, you know, derogatory or lazy and, and these tropes that were evoked towards uh African Americans that were tropes that were evoked for different Latino groups, Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans. Uh, I teach a Latino history class currently, and that's what we focus on a lot. Just there's one part of the story that is segregation up through the 1950s, um, but also the curriculum that was being taught that much of the early curriculum in, in Chicano history is based off of the work of social workers and early sociologists that wrote about how 
you know, Mexican Americans or Chicanos were, you know, childlike or were, you know, backward or lazy and that the, these early travel writings from social workers and, and sociologists and even politicians shaped U.S. curriculum and treated uh, Mexican Americans as quote unquote Oriental actually as, as these kind of different human beings that might not have that mental capacity to handle the same rig the same curriculum that white students do right and so the activists of the 60s really wanted to flip the script on the narrative and, and talk about it in a way that was empowering versus as derogatory or making you feel like you know you don't belong and so a lot of it was really historical um, from what I have seen is just kind of the, the changing of that narrative of teaching, you know, the labor history of activists, the, the key kind of movements that activists were having, you know, the, impl the impact that they made in World War II and winning Purple Hearts and fighting for civil rights. And so all of this really shaped how activists at K through 12, as well as in higher ed, um, that folks really wanted, you know, to be taught these these legit histories. Like now, we're we're lucky that these activists fought for these changes because the courses I teach didn't exist before the San Francisco State Strike. The courses you're teaching, right, didn't exist prior to the '60s, and so we definitely were able to then change long long-standing disciplines like anthropology, like history, like sociology. Um, but also from a perspective of ethnic studies, which, you know, we both know that at the heart of ethnic studies, whether it's Black studies, Asian American studies, Latino studies, is the connection to the community between the campus. And there's supposed to be, right, this cyclical process that the knowledge produced in the ivory tower is going to help the conditions in the community. And the community is also going to influence what's going on in the ivory tower. And so, you know, we see many, many activists become the first professors. They are the first teachers and, you know, they are quote unquote, these organic intellectuals that learned, right? Perhaps weren't professionally trained um, PhD recipients. And we both have a mentor by the name of Perro Degbovi, right? That writes a lot about amateur historians and the way that folks outside of the ivory tower um, create and shape history um, that we teach. And so, Many of those first uh, professors in Latino studies or, or in Chicano studies at uh, San Francisco State and at Berkeley were community informed, originally had, you know, years of experience in community activism. And even folks like Amiri Baraka ends up teaching at San Francisco State College. And for me, that's kind of like a, it's a turning point because many of the activists I write about were physically present in 68, 69 at Berkeley. They were physically present in San Francisco State, but they were also present in their communities, whether it was the Mission District in San Francisco, uh, uh, Chinatowns in San Francisco as well, and then uh, Asian Americans also doing the same. And so, yeah, that's kind of where that, and then it's this point of solidarity, right? Where the movement for ethnic studies incorporated all of these different groups of people struggling to create schools of ethnic studies. And it wasn't just, I think we do a lot of times teach this like California centric history as far as like San Francisco State and Berkeley, which are important. But then there's other examples like UC San Diego who create a school called the La Mamba Zapata Institute, which is, you know, bringing in that African culture as well as bringing in a, a Mexican revolution, but two, two revolutionaries, right? From Africa and from, Latin, and from Mexico. And folks like Angela Davis are teaching some of the first courses in that, or she's a TA at that point, but she's a graduate student at when this is going on. And so there's just a long list of examples of these connections between the community and campuses. Indeed, indeed. And that's why we got to thank people like Dr. Martha Biondi with her book, Black Revolution on Campus, because she takes it outside of that. I got, I got a list right here. <laughs> indeed, my students just began reading it in the intro to Black Studies. We started with the Rojas book, obviously. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, you know, she takes it out of that California-centric mm -hmm. uh, approach. And, you know, we look at the, the, the Northeast, uh, we look at the South, we look at the Midwest, uh, we look at HBCUs as well. Uh, and, and we see these, right, these similar processes, uh, which in many ways make sense because some of the early 
uh, Chicano students, you know, attended HBCUs, uh, even international uh, uh, Latin American students uh, and uh, West Indian Caribbean students. They attended places like Tuskegee, coming from Costa Rica, coming from Cuba, and et cetera, et cetera. So we see that trajectory. Now, I think it's important, and I think we need to emphasize that the some of the first of those uh, those educators in uh, Black studies and Chicano Latinx studies, uh, and just like Black studies, there's many names, Africana studies, et cetera, et cetera. And we see similar things with uh, Latinx Chicano studies as well, depending on regions and various considerations. Uh, not a lot of schools are changing to Central American studies as well. Okay. Okay. Yep, sorry. Yeah. It's just yeah, they're, so they're problematizing it even more. They don't want to leave out the Guatemalans anymore. <laughs> My peoples. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. But that some of the first educators were th these activists themselves mm -hmm. who uh, obtained bachelor's degrees and or master's degrees and were plucked uh, to be the first educators uh, in that and their, their connections to the communities. So I think of people like at Northwestern, Laron Bennett, my frat brother, most famously known for being one of the editors of Ebony Magazine, but uh, a trained historian at the master's degree level. Uh, what types of examples, not to put you on the spot, do we have with Chicano studies? Yeah, uh, my first thought is right away to what is now Cal State University of Los Angeles. So uh, Cal State LA in the 60s and 70s had, well, uh, part of my research involves that campus because the activists I write about also were, were coming from East LA to East LA Community College. And then from there, they would uh, hop over to Cal State LA, which at that point would have been uh, Los Angeles College, I believe. And so when I look at the curriculum from, you know, the, the early scholars that were teaching these courses, where I look at the names of who was teaching, many of them had roots, um, such as Burt Corona, who, um, Burt Corona was an activist since the 30s and 40s um, with the major labor unions in, in LA, working with uh, Rand A. Philip Randolph and working with others. And he also then founded a, uh, immigrant rights organization in the 60s called El Centro de Acción Social Autonoma, which is uh, acronym CASA. And eventually CASA becomes Marxist-Leninist and kicks out Burt, but Corona is teaching, you know, very similar to Black Studies. Those early kind of iterations were, you know, focused on these kind of Marxist scholars, right? Where you, you if you look, you see a lot of things about political economy. Um, so Corona was teaching like a Latino political economy course. And then there's another person uh, by the name of James Jimmy Franco, who he came out of an organization called La Raza Unida Party, which was a third political party formed by uh, activists in Texas that were trying to use electoral politics, um, winning local elections. And eventually the organization makes its way to places like Nebraska and uh, uh, Illinois, as well as in California. And so Jimmy Franco comes out of the labor committee of La Raza Unida Party. And he also then becomes an influential organizer in a group known as the August 29th Movement, which was the group that I wrote my dissertation on. Um, and so he's on campus. And what I found is that these activists that became professors also had an alternative route of becoming uh, administration type folks that are working in diversity type of offices or um, things to recruit students. So really the opening of the door of campuses is more than just the, the professors and the curriculum, right? It even included staff positions where these activists were then able to give, you know, work study or to give research study to these younger generations and also to mentor in a lot of ways because, you know, a lot of students, even today, there's a lot of universities that are still predominantly white institutions, right? PWI is where you know, some of these sizable populations of African-Americans and Latinos are added together, maybe 20% of 100% students' populations, right? And in the 60s, it was even less so, right? We have maybe lucky if you have 3%, 5% of some of these pop. So a lot of times these folks were by themselves um, encountering, you know, these daily, these daily racist actions, essentially. And 
they needed help. Some of them did drop out um, for two different reasons. Some dropped out from campus to enter the community and abandon, you know, that dream of earning a bachelor's degree, but earning a different kind of knowledge outside of campus. Um, and then others dropped out for the various reasons of no support, um, perhaps having only predominantly white professors and others still the curriculum being not tailored to their culture, not tailored to their language. And so it really, when I look at these campuses, I see that it's radical, right? They're getting institutional power to help their communities succeed in college campuses. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and to be quite honest, here at Western Carolina, we're in that position uh, of those low demographics in regards to African Americans and Latinx Americans. Uh, but we have a strong and growing Latinx studies program. And we've, I was hired and we've just created Global Black Studies. And, and, and to be frank, right, uh, part of it is to help not just recruit, but retain. Absolutely. Uh, students uh, as well. Uh, and, and that can't be understated, right? You know, these youth that we're talking about uh, 50 years ago, right, uh, 60 years ago, you know, they, they, they made that connection and advocated, you know, for it. And as you mentioned earlier, we are products of that just as simply on uh, the types of courses that we offer and, and that we teach. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it can't be understated. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is Unfortunately, and we can get to this a little bit later, but I do want to mention it now, it seems that many of those youth leaders today express uh, approaches and notions that they, that the youth of today <laughs> shouldn't be in leadership and in the forefront, which is extremely confusing and problematic when we really study you know, these movements and their products of these movements. Yeah, and, and one thing I, I wanna add real quick is that, you know, I survived, and I use the word survive very forcefully, um, my undergraduate experience at UC Irvine, which did have, you know, we did have a little bit more size. Of, now it's a Hispanic serving institution, but when I was there, I think we were 10% of the population or so. and. Um, I found Chicano Latino studies as my home. My, my bachelor's degree is in Chicano studies. And, you know, I wasn't even thinking about being a historian, but then even going to a place like Michigan State, you know, I found refuge in the Chicano studies program at Michigan State with many folks. And then the various institutions I've been at, it's very, very different. Here at Pittsburgh, we're currently uh, having a cluster hire in Latinx studies, which is, you know, when we think about it in relation to Berkeley, who has had, you know, these longstanding programs since 68, since 70, there's still many institutions that are now fighting to create change. And there's new generations of activists fighting for ethnic studies still, because these are oftentimes the programs that are first on the chopping block, right, when cuts are coming. And then a lot of folks will talk about, you know, the co-optation of these studies as well. Um, uh, the Rooks book, right? The White Money, Black Power um, mm -hmm. talks about the way that the Ford Foundation and others were able to kind of de-radicalize these programs because this was meant to be the only way to legitimize them, right? That you can't have these radical programs in these institutions because many of those early books were considered, you know, just like personal memoirs or personal experiences and not like historically rig not rigorous research. And so, there's a case of uh, Rodolfo Acuna who wrote this book called Occupied America that when he went up for tenure, um, they, they, would, they challenged in the 60s and 70s if it was actually a historically researched book. And he had to take UC Santa Barbara to court because they treated it as like not a, you know, not a book for tenure. And, you know, years after that, there's different iterations of that. And we still see it today with um, various cases of, uh, particularly Black Latinas being denied tenure at, you know, some of the Ivy institutions. And so there's still a lot that we got to fight for, right? And, and I think there's a lot of these younger generations of activists and students that are still pushing the envelope for us to have more space in these, in these campuses. Indeed. And I think one of the key things from those student movements 
uh, that pushed for ethnic studies is they understood policy. They understood policy recommendations. They understood policy change. It wasn't about, I feel, I feel. I feel like you racist. I want you to know that my feelings are hurt. They, policy, policy, policy. And I think for this generation, they need to understand that policy in regards to for ethnic studies and those of us who may have joint appointments and et cetera of policy that needs to be established for tenure and promotion processes. Uh, from my perspective, the greatest, the greatest journal for what I do is the Journal of African American History. Right. That is more prominent for my field than what the AHA produces, what the Southern Historical Society produces, all of that. Mm -hmm. They, in my field, in my perspective, they are subordinate. But how many uh, universities even are aware of the Journal of African American History? And when they see someone has a publication in it, that that means something, that means a great deal. And I'm sure there are comparable uh, journals and things of that nature in your field. So if you could just tell us one or two for the audience so they'll know those journals. Yeah, there's a, there's one out of UCLA, which I might end up screwing it up, but the, oh, it's called Aslan actually, which Aslan was the mythical homeland of the Aztec peoples. And so it was created again, also in the late sixties. I mean, the Journal of African-American History has a long longer history, but um, in many ways, it was these early activists that did begin their own journals. Um, and yeah, they, uh, Aslan now is, is, I think, it probably started in 68 or 69. I will, I'll get the, the year wrong, but it is very much more a, a ethnic studies type of journal versus like the Journal of African American History that is, you know, it's history predominant, but it also brings in these other, these other viewpoints as well. And um, one other thing I, I forgot to mention is that when we were talking about these student movements, uh, particularly on campuses, it's all the way through from community colleges, through state institutions, through you know the, the private schools. And then as Stephen Bradley recently wrote in his, his really powerful book, even in the African-American activists in the Ivy Leagues, right? There's iconic pictures carrying you know guns inside the, whether it was Columbia or other institutions and so we're not just talking about, you know, institutions that are close to these communities of color, but we're talking about, you know, all the way through to Yale, to Dartmouth, to community colleges throughout the country as well. Um, but definitely Aslan would be the journal. And, and even that, that kind of pre-Columbian indigenous histories were things that people fought for to talk about things like colonization, right? Um, so using the name Aslan as a journal title is, is a political action um, to, to uh, honor that heritage, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. And people forget the community college aspect, and I'm glad you mentioned that, or the junior college aspect as well. So we say community and junior colleges. You know, I mean, that's where the Black Panther Party self-defense, right? Merritt College. Uh, the former Crane College in Chicago, which is now Malcolm X College, where Fred Hampton enrolled before his assassination uh, to, you know, to obviously to learn a couple of things, but also to organize uh, students and all the way up to, like you said, the Ivy Leagues, as well as uh, so-called minority serving institutions, right? As well, right? We see it all because there is a misnomer. And I, I didn't realize how acute it was until I moved here to North Carolina and entered academia here in North Carolina. Where people have this impression that HBC uses this, are these bastions of black radicalism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that because it's an HBCU, they will automatically have black studies uh, or they have a curriculum where they don't need black studies, which for the most part, all of those things are false. And, they're not bastions of radicalism. Many of them do not have black studies and many of them need a curriculum overhaul that includes black studies. And now increasingly for HBCUs, Chicano or Latinx studies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of Chicano and Latinx students are finding spaces for themselves at HBCUs as well. Right. 
Yeah, I, I totally just purchased uh, Joshua Myers' book about Howard University, where he, he focuses on people like Roz Baraka, who's the son of Amiri Baraka, who eventually becomes the mayor of, of Newark. And, you know, he d grapples with that tension of, you know, there was a little bit of radicalism, but at the same time, there was a lot of conservatism as well. Um, and I, I think of, to the Latino studies point, I think it's schools like Texas State or uh, a few of the other HBCUs that are hiring in Latino history, which, you know, 20, 30 years ago was also happening. But I think now we're definitely, those demographics are really changing. And, you know, there is no Latino equivalent. Um, I've been asked many times about kind of when the first Latinx PhD was actually handed and I, I'm still doing the research on it. And many, many, uh, many professionals, many scholars of, of these fields, you know, can point to certain folks, but then it becomes a, a matter of like, well, where did they get the degree and when? And, you know, there's no clear cut like W.E.B. Du Bois perhaps. Um, and so there's all, there's not this long, as long of a legacy of, of a kind of historically black uh, legacy in the kind of Latino version where now we're seeing it with his, this kind of the signifier, right, of Hispanic serving institutions, but there's no really kind of, you know, schools that are just for Latino, not just for, but, you know, spaces for Latino students to be the, the dominant um, demographic. Awesome. And I wonder, uh, there's another book recently um, by Jennifer Jones, who I think the anybody living in North Carolina would, would like to take a, a peek at is, she focuses on uh, Winston-Salem and what she talks about is the browning of the new south and so demographic changes in states like North Carolina and how this is going to be you know an important discussion for us to look at in the future where Latino migrants or Latin American immigrants and migrants are not they're still arriving to places like Los Angeles and New York and mm -hmm. Chicago but they're also arriving to Durham North Carolina they're arriving to um, parts in the South where, you know, there's actually a long legacy of laborers arriving in Mississippi. Um, and for me at first, it was like, wait a second, there's Latinos in Mississippi in like the early 1900s. And Julie Weiss wrote a book about this where, you know, Mexican and Mexican American workers actually begin replacing a lot of African American sharecroppers who are moving up during the Great Migration. Um, and they become sharecroppers in the South because that was a lot better labor than some of the wages that they were being paid in Texas or perhaps being paid even in the Midwest. And we know a lot about that like diaspora. So even we can even point earlier to kind of these um, cross connections between black and brown folk, um, just to kind of add a little bit more historical context. No, indeed. And that's very important. I remember uh, when I first moved to North Carolina, uh, one of my fraternity brothers got married in Raleigh and I stayed in Durham and I knew I was home when I went to the to the convenience store and it was a convenience store and laundromat and I could get my Goya Pinto beans. <laughs> I could put them in a the bowl and microwave them and put some ketchup on them. I know it sounds nasty, but it's good to me. <laughs> we all got our stuff. <laughs> and he, but I but I but I knew and I and I and I laughed. Uh because I also saw uh, the food trucks and I say, all right, I, I, I can be comfortable here because I had, you know, some anxieties being a Midwest guy moving to the, to the South, uh, you know, but that, that really, I was like, oh, I, I could feel comfortable here. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, and more needs to be done, as you said uh, about that. And these emerging communities and longstanding overlooked communities in certain areas. Now, that, that's a good segue into uh, what I would define loosely for the purpose of this conversation is mass community organizers, mm -hmm. right? You know, so that would move it away. Uh, I wouldn't frame Fred Hampton, for example, as a student organizer, right? He would be a mass community organizer. Uh, and you mentioned the leader of the Young Lords. Uh, where did we see a lot of intersections and collaboration between the Black Power and uh, brown power movements in regards to co community mass organizing? Yeah, I, I think one place to look is uh, Newark, New Jersey, actually, with Amiri Baraka in the 60s. And he's creating, he takes the cultural route to activism, right? He, also intellectual. And he writes for a ton of magazines like Liberator Magazine, 
Um, he, like I mentioned earlier, he travels to Cuba with the Fair Play for Cuba committee. But then in Newark, you had, uh, it was a location for Puerto Rican migrants to arrive. So Puerto Ricans are arriving to New York City, obviously, and this is how we get this long-standing Puerto Rican community. Um, but Puerto Ricans are also arriving to Newark. And what Baraka and some of the, and these other activists do is they organize to elect Kenneth Gibson, uh, one of the first black mayors in the country um, in the late 60s, early 70s. I can't remember the exact year, but that's kind of one iconic moment. And Baraka creates a truce with the young lords because at this point, Baraka is following Malana Karenga um, and the US organization, which was a bitter rival, right, of the Black Panthers. And they kind of come to a truce, like, all right, we're, we're good, right? We're gonna organize together. And um, I think in, in a, another area would be um, in the, the third world studies movements, uh, as we already talked about with Berkeley and with San Francisco State. Um, but then the Black Panthers, I, I keep stressing this because I think a lot of historians, we know about the Black Panthers and the Young Lords and their connections, but the Black Panthers also affected another group known as Los Siete de la Raza. And the way that the Los Siete comes out of the Mission District in San Francisco, which is a, it was a, both the state, a black brown space that allowed for some of these coalitions because space matters, right? These, these communities oftentimes are either close together, they are you know going to the same grocery stores, they're um, and I do want to also note that there is a lot of conflict between these communities uh, sometimes, and, and there's a lot of camps, right? There's the cooperation camp that only focuses on these solidarities, and then there's also a conflict camp that looks at the tensions, because oftentimes, as capitalism does, right, it tries to pit different communities against one another, whether it's over jobs, whether it's over benefits, uh, whether it's like welfare benefits and others. Um, housing, housing is a big housing. Thing. Yeah, exactly. And so I do want to acknowledge that, um, and we can also think about that a lot too, because there is a lot of anti-blackness in the Latino community, even amongst Afro Latino towards Afro Latino folks, which I think hopefully in a bit we can talk about Afro Latinos as well. Um, but yeah, so Newark, and then this group Los Siete, it becomes an organization that's actually tied to San Francisco State College. Um, where you have a case where a police officer is killed. Um, seven Latino youth are charged with murder. Uh, two of them weren't actually physically present at the scene of the crime, but they were still arrested. And then it ended, there's a court case and it ended up being that the police officer's partner actually shot and killed him. So it was friendly fire, but the youth were charged. And when the court case is happening, Huey P. Newton is actually in jail at the same time. So the leader of the Panthers is in jail. And he's writing in, you know, the Panthers paper and other activists are to free these seven men um, who are actually, most of them are Central American from El Salvador and from Nicaragua. So that's a whole other element, right? The Central American component. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that the Panthers give them about like $25,000 to help support the legal defense case. They lend their, their attorney, Charles Gary, uh, to the Los Siete group for their defense. And then Bobby Seale and David Hilliard, Hilliard and others give this organization the backside of the Black Panther newspaper. So there's examples where there's a, a Spanish side of the Black Panther paper that's by this group, Los Siete La Raza. So really, you know, because there, there's a, another discussion to be had about, you know, politics, solidarity in, you know, the kind of verbal way and offering solidarity. And then there's actual solidarity between lending of resources or lending of space, right? In newspapers and writing stories to support each other. But the same happens even with Amiri Baraka. And so police brutality is one where place we can look. And this connects to the present moment where the same time there's a lot of uh, calls for abolishing the police, there's also calls for abolishing ICE, right? Immigration Correction Enforcement. And for many activists, these two things intersect. And so, um, that's one, a contemporary way. And then another way is also in the present with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there's folks that are really trying to get us to think about Black Lives Matter as a transnational movement and how there's connections between favelas in Brazil to Ferguson in Missouri, um, connections between Afro-Latinos in Colombia with, again, Ferguson or what's going on in the States. And there's actual physical traveling of Black Lives Matter movement leaders to Colombia, to Brazil, 
um, there's a great edited volume by the North American Congress uh, for Latin America, NACLA, which has a, a great um, thing called uh, uh, around taking a hemispheric approach to contemporary black activism. Because that what they argue, a lot of the authors argue is that police brutality towards, uh, I'll use the phrasing black bodies is higher also in Latin America, whether we look at Puerto Rico, whether we look at Brazil, the Brazilian police is killing more black Brazilians at a higher rate than actually here in the US regarding you know, mass killings here. And so that transnationalism is also important. And so I'd, I'd kind of say that for the contemporary. And then historically, uh, one other kind of highlight I want to point to is electoral politics. So I already mentioned kind of the, the Kenneth Gibson example in Newark, but there's others. There's Mel King in Boston, uh, another African-American mayoral candidate. Uh, there's David Dinkins in New York City, again, another African-American mayoral candidate who is who wins. Um, and then there's the Harold Washington campaign in Chicago as well. Um, that all of these examples bring together what we could call rainbow coalitions. Um, and then there's the big one, which is uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson runs for president in 1984 and 1988. And part of my research actually gets to this because many of the activists I write about, whether it's Miri Baraka, whether it's uh, Asian American women or uh, Latino leaders, they're all camp not only campaigning for Jackson, but they bring Jackson um, to different locations like Watsonville, California to give speeches to Latina immigrant cannery workers. Um, and he connects these kind of true traditions of, you know, what he says is that Watsonville becomes the kind of movement for social justice that was going on in the South 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. Uh, Jesse Jackson is actually the first presidential candidate to give a speech in San Francisco's Chinatown, which was not a coincidence because many of the Asian American write, people I write about were helping organize his schedules, were writing some of the speeches. Um, and Jackson appears at these different locations. And so he provided a lot of hope for a lot of individuals. Uh, they really believed in the movement. I, I, the best way I can consider it is that it was kind of the Bernie Sanders movement before Bernie Sanders. Sanders actually uh, supports Jesse Jackson's uh, presidential campaigns, endorses him, I guess is the word. So, and then I just thought of one more. I know I'm talking a lot, but- Oh no, uh, that's why we got you here. Yeah, you've got the, um, the Poor People's Campaign is, is one that I, I can't forget to mention, right? We. Uh, it's a political reason why it was called the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, right before he's assassinated, this is kind of what he's working towards, right? And in a lot of ways, his assassination also causes the movement to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not disintegrate, but to create, like to be schismed, where um, you have cases of the Brown Berets, which was a, a political organization also modeled after the Black Panther Party. They wear berets, they wear the sunglasses, they wear the leather jackets, but it's, it's, it's Chicano youth doing this. They write 12 point programs, um, advocating a lot of what the Panthers are doing. So they arrive in Washington, DC. Welfare rights activists um, from the Chicano movement and welfare rights is also another intersection of black and brown activism um, because I do think the narrative around welfare rights is focused predominantly on uh, white women a little bit and feminism is a whole other avenue as well. Uh, but I, I have a dear friend by the name of Rosie Bermudez who writes a lot about this. Um, and she traces how some of these activists are at the Poor People's Campaign advocating right for jobs, advocating for livable wages, advocating for wages for women who are in the home, um, better benefits, better welfare benefits. And then other leaders like Rodolfo, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. Um, in Chicano history, we talk about kind of the Originally, there was this four great men thesis where people were really writing about Cesar Chavez as one, and the Black Panthers support Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez supports them. Uh, SNCC also supports the great boycotts and the Chavez campaigns. But then there's another, and Corky Gonzalez is in Denver, and he creates a group known as the Crusade for Justice, which is one of these big groups. And he arrives in, uh, in DC another leader by the name of Reyes Lopez Tijerina was organizing with people like Malana Karenga and others. And he arrives in, in DC as well. And what happens is that with the assassination of King, uh, a lot of folks weren't able to kind of talk to each other. And then we can see there kind of some of that conflict where 
everybody kind of had their own ideas of how the movement should move forward. But what tied all these movements was the occupations that these folks have, right? Or the opportunities for certain occupations. So that would definitely be probably the biggest example as far as how many thousands arrive. Also, it stormed that whole week. They had set up a tent city around, you know, DC, but then it, it stormed and mud and, you know, all that stuff and really kind of, we'll never know, right? What could have been, but the act of solidarity in that was, was very significant. Indeed, indeed. And I think most historians would agree with you that the weather was probably the most uh, detrimental contributing factor to the stalling of the Poor People's Campaign under the leadership of Reverend Jesse Jackson. It wasn't a deficiency on his behalf, to be fair. It, it was a lot of variables. Uh, and, and what you said reminded me of, I remember uh, in 1995, I went to the Million Man March. In 1996, I took, I was still undergraduate myself, but we organized and we took some uh, students to the uh, Latino, Immigrants and Poor People's March on Washington uh, in 1996. And to see the, the diversity and, and the support. And I, and, I, and I felt at the time that this was uh, a remnant or a revenant of, of that Poor People's uh, campaign. And to talk about Afro-Latinos a bit, uh, to go way back, because we've, we've even, without directly stating it, we've indicated that prior history of Black radicalism uh, and uh, Chicano radicalism uh, and, and, and struggles at the turn of the century, uh, you know, uh, captured, you know, uh, by people like uh, the Afro-Latino uh, uh, Arturo Schomburg, uh, you know, the Afro-Puerto Rican, who was a member of the Puerto Rican independence movement, who also went to Cuba to fight for Cuban independence with Jose Marti's revolution. Uh, Jose Marti himself out of Cuba, going to Harlem and living there in exile for a while as he prepared. Right. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the Afro-Latinos uh, throughout Central and South America that Marcus Garvey witnessed and visited when he went on his journeys uh, across Central and, and South America. Uh, and people like James Weldon Johnson although many will argue, and I'll be one of them, that in many ways he was an agent of empire, but his uh, work uh, in Panama uh, and, and, and et cetera, uh, and the admiration of the UNI movement uh, of people like uh, the Maceo brothers out of Cuba, uh, the Afro-Cubans who were the generals in the failed uh, revolution uh, in the turn of the century, uh, and we've seen a long history, right? Uh, part of the reason why African Americans uh, have a particular view of Fidel Castro or both Castro brothers, Fidel and Raul, uh, as well as Ernesto Che Guevara, right? And that many people have criticisms, you know, uh, some are extremely valid of the the, the, the executions that uh, that Che oversaw in Cuba of dissidents and uh, counter-revolutionaries, but uh, taking uh, Afro-Cubans to Africa and eventually to the Congo to overthrow the right-wing American CIA-backed dictator, Joseph Desiree Mobutu, uh, for example, uh, the close connection that the Castro regime had in Angola fighting for the left-leaning uh, revolutionary fighters against the CIA-backed counter, CIA and South African apartheid regime back counter-revolutionaries. And also contributing so much militarily that they stopped the role of the South African apartheid regime north of the Zambezi River, for example, uh, he kicked their but I'm just gonna say he kicked their asses back down to what we now call, well, the former Rhodesias in apartheid South Africa, you know, that's what they did, right? So we had, we have a particular, many of us have a particular hero view or a comrade view of Castro uh, as a result. But I recall, 
when I lived in Miami, uh, I, 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 I ran into a couple uncomfortable situations. Uh, most people thought I was Dominican until I opened my mouth and they were like, oh, well, he's black. Uh, and when I would talk to the Dominican cats, they would tell me constantly, no, no, no Negro, no Negro, no Negro, no Negrito. They were adamant to not be associated and affiliated with black, but these brothers were darker than me. You know, and, and there's a lot of schism we're seeing on that island <laughs> with Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Sammy Sosa is a, a tragic comedy of, of, of that ism. Uh, but, but how do we come to that? Or how do we get there? Cause it was, you know, I, I don't know. It just, it baffles me sometimes. Yeah, I think uh, like, every, like every historian, right? I think we can even go further back. Uh, I start my Latino history courses with the transatlantic slave, with, with pre-Columbian societies. So the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans to talk about indigeneity, because that's also something that creates yeah. and, you know, for, for a lot of folks, it was, you know, for a long time, they didn't celebrate their indigeneity um, it, because it was seen as backward, right? Or not as modern um, until you have the 1900s in, in places like Mexico and Peru and others that begin flipping that narrative and actually start celebrating that indigeneity. Um, but with the transatlantic slave trade, I think what's important to note, right, is that 95% of the, the, those folks that are enslaved and brought over are going to the Caribbean, to Puerto Rico, to Haiti, to, Haiti, to uh, the Dominican, to and then to Brazil, of course, but also all throughout. And there's many scholars that are, are now writing about this, right? We have a good friend, John Milstead, who writes about Afro-Mexicans in Mexico. Um, and we can see that linking this back to the transatlantic slave trade and then caste systems, right? There are these systems that uh, shaped society and, you know, your race determined where you were at the, on the totem pole. If you had one drop of either black or indigenous blood, you were automatically, you know, seen as lesser than. And so that's kind of, I think, where we can see some of these roots of anti-blackness and even anti-indigenous perspectives. And then when we take that, you know, race in, in the Americas is, you know, it's ugly. It's, uh, there's a lot of anti-blackness. And this is why a lot of folks don't want to be considered black, right? Because they've seen what happens to black individuals in the United States with slavery. Um, and then even post-emancipation, they see Jim Crow. Um, one person I think we could even look for um, is this tension you're talking about, right? Where in some space, we all change, all of our races and our backgrounds change based on location, right? Where, you know, we have cases of Dominicans in New York being treated as, you know, black African-Americans, but they're, you know, when they speak Spanish, it becomes like, wait a second, like, you know, sometimes the African community, African American community is like, you're not one of us, but other times, you know, it's like, of course, like we are, you know, tied by these long legacies. And I think we can even look to sports and we can look to music where a lot of Afro Latino baseball players actually play in the, the quote unquote Negro leagues, right? Because they were also segregated out of uh, major league baseball. Um, and then with, with integration with uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, the, the, the sports scholar uh, Adrian Burgos talks a lot about this, that there was cases of uh, a gentleman by the name of Minnie, uh, Minnie Minosa, who three years later um, integrates the Chicago White Sox. And even baseball scholars don't really acknowledge these Af Afro-Latino players that also broke the color line um, right around the same time period as Jackie Robinson, because they weren't necessarily black African-American, but they were still black, you know, from the Latin American perspective. And so we can look at folks like Roberto Clemente, one of the legendary, right, Afro-Puerto Rican baseball players. And from his own testimonies, what he used to say is like, he got a double bet because he was not only black, but he was also Latin American, which, you know, that created a lot of issues for him with the Spanish language. And, you know, he lives here in Pittsburgh. So I'm really much getting more deep into that history, but, you know, when he tries to buy a house, he's not allowed, he's only allowed to buy a home in certain communities, right? Certain black communities. And so even when we look at sports, we can see that as well. And so even the, the there was a lot, there's a lot of scholars who write about um, how problematic the term even Latinx is for Black Lives Matter was because 
it erased Afro Latinos um, because it kind of felt that, you know, Latinx wasn't black, but there is a lot of blackness in the Americas, right? And so scholars like Paul Joseph Oro, who's at Smith College, he writes a lot about Black Garifunas, which are an indigenous black community in Honduras. And he writes about their diaspora to places like New York City. And so there's a lot of that going on where I think it's important for us to consider just how, when we do think of Latinx, a lot of us do predominantly think of lighter skinned Latinos. We don't really first think of Afro Latinos, right? And so moving forward, I think that there's a lot of new programs that are stressing this. Um, here at Pittsburgh, we have an Afro Latinx initiative led by Dr. Michelle Reed Vasquez. And so, you know, we could even go further back, right? This is where I think black studies and African diaspora studies is so important that other scholars like Glenn Chambers talks about, right? How black workers from the Caribbean are brought into places like Guatemala, like Honduras, where they're pitted against, you know, indigenous workers and pitted against lighter skinned workers. And that was a way that the, the owners could prevent solidarity and labor organizing because of race and class, or mostly just race, right? That these folks won't speak to one another across the racial line. And so, yeah, I think we have these long legacies. Um, I use different readings in my class that talks about anti-Blackness throughout, you know, the 19th and 20th century, where there was cases where Puerto Ricans after 1898, so the acquisition of the Puerto Rican island, they came up to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and they went to school with Native Americans and with African Americans. And the they did not want to be associated with either of these two communities, despite having oh, yeah. blood, indigenous blood and then having, you know, black blood as well. And so we can really see how deep seated it is. And again, there's a lot of anti-blackness in the Latino community as far as perceptions of African-Americans or perceptions of Afro-Latinos as well. So yeah, I, I've really tried to kind of incorporate a lot of that new literature into my class because I admit that in my own training, I didn't really get that much of that training because so much of that scholarship is currently coming, um, which I think there's a lot of great scholarship that is, that is about to be put out. Yeah, Jessica Marie Johnson is doing great right. work on that uh, as an Afro-Latina. Uh, and we have a question before I go to uh, ask the question. Uh, I think I think what you highlighted uh, is it, 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 there's also a flip side, uh, and it's a rising, uh, and I mean this in the most derogatory way I possibly could say it, because those who know me, I keep it 100, some reactionary BS, and that's this ADOS. American descendants of slavery, who are now <clears throat> uh, using the, those xenophobic language, that xenophobic language against uh, uh, Latinx people, including Afro Latinos and West Indians, right? Uh, and, and, and they're framing it as a competition for jobs, a competition for classroom space, and a competition for housing. They're framing it in these these terms and, and, rep and reparations is at the heart too. Oh, right? reparations! Yeah, exactly. You know, in the capitalist society, money is the first way you can get people to turn on each other. You can get two brothers to turn on each other over fifty dollar bill, <laughs> but nonetheless, and it's and it's really troubling to me, you know. And that's one of the reasons I wanted us to have this dialogue to you know to to be able to shave you know that 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 mold off the off the onion, mm -hmm. as to say. All right, uh, an, an anonymous attendee asked the question, how could a future teacher apply the information from this event to their future teaching? Uh, yeah. Any suggestions? I think definitely uh, one, some, and I think the second question too is kind of tied to this, is uh, just the different, there's a lot of like scholarship out there that, and a lot of it is accessible, I think, one way I would try to incorporate some of this stuff is meeting students at the cultural point, because you know if we use something like hip hop, right? Hip hop is created by Puerto Rican and African American youth, and so I think sometimes that Puerto Rican component gets a little bit left out when we think of you know what is the the worldwide shaping genre that now is hip hop, right? That shapes our everyday experiences. Um, but I think one way of, of doing this is just just to try to 
do relational race history. Um, I think I've moved more towards this in my own teaching as far as, you know, when you are talking about the transatlantic slave trade to, to broaden it out, to also talk about, you know, Latin America and, you know, the, the, the different areas that African enslaved peoples were sent to, right? But even moving forward a little bit, just thinking of Jim Crow and, you know, also trying to bring in how we have Bonner Jaime Crow occurring at the same time, these systems, right? Whether it's the systems of enslavement or the systems of um, education as well as we've been talking about like segregation. Um, but I also think then continuing that conversation to even talk about lynchings, um, which is a very hard history to teach. I just, a couple of weeks ago, I was, you know, thinking about this and we, uh, I assigned the work of Monica Munoz Martinez, who she just won a, a MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, and she writes about uh, lynchings of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the Texas borderlands. And so when, I, when I'm teaching, whether it's the US survey or teaching, uh, which is general US history, right? Or teaching Latino history, we can't ignore the African American experience. We can't ignore the Asian American experience because if we even look at uh, Japanese internment during World War II, much of the chain link fences that are used to intern Japanese American citizens during the war ends up being reappropriated and putting being put down at the border. So then serving as a different type of confinement space, right? So in a lot of ways, it's thinking about what scholars are now saying, settler colonialism, which I think is a place that it sounds really theoretical, but when we break down these histories and we think about, right, Chinese exclusion during the age of Jim Crow, or we think about um, just the way all of uh, indigenous histories, right? whether it's indigenous genocide or indigenous displacement here in the US. And um, I have a, a, a colleague by the name of Elena Roberts who just released a book about you know, African slaves and, and Native Americans uh, holding slaves, right? And so how we get this kind of relation between African-American and indigenous identities to complicate the, the Eidos actual narrative, right? That you know, tries to pit all these identities against one each other. Um, so I think just being open to Teaching ourselves is one way I would, I would kind of say it, that a lot of these histories I didn't know about, but I, I try to use the syllabus as an opportunity to learn along with the students. Um, and I think acknowledging with students that, you know, we might be experts in something, but we're not experts in everything. And so um, that's definitely one thing I would, I would say. And just also looking towards broader publications like NACLA, um, I think, a lot of times these journals that publish online are a lot faster than historians, right? You and I, Klanji, you know that, you know, it takes eight years sometimes to get even one article out. So there's a lot of public scholarship. Um, I think one other way um, I would, one program I would, I would shout out is the Civil Rights in Black and Brown, uh, but the coalition or Civil Rights History in Black and Brown in Texas, which um, scholars such as Max Crockmall, Catherine Bynum, and others work to collect oral histories from uh, activists from the, both the Black, the, the Black Power Movement as well as uh, the Chicano Movement and how they created coalitions for civil rights in a place like Texas. So using oral histories as primary sources to get you know, students to think about how people during the time were thinking about these coalitions, um, definitely. Awesome, and then that leads to our next question by Dr. Heine Crawford. Uh, and you mentioned some studies uh, and some texts, but she asked uh, if you could recommend one or two texts that everyone needs to read as foundational information on Latinx history and the intersections between black and brown activism. That's, a, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> I know, I didn't want to touch it. <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there's definitely, um, I would say scholars like Jeffrey Ogbar actually, who Jeffrey Ogbar does predominantly write about black power. Um, but I think he has a couple chapters and a couple couple articles about the young lords and the um, African Americans to talk about quote unquote radical ethnic nationalism or radical the you know thinking about rainbow radicalism is what he uses and so that's I think a good starting point. Um, there's also the work of Gordon Mantler who he wrote a book called Power to the Poor. I'm like reading it. Uh, Black Brown Coalition and the Fight for Economic Justice, 1960 to 1974. Um, it's a really accessible book that uses a lot of oral histories um, to talk about not only the Poor People's Campaign, but everything leading up to the Poor People's Campaign. 
Um, and then there's a there's a new book I'd give a shout out to, which doesn't really it, it incorporates a lot of Black history, particularly Black religious history, and the Young Lords Party. Um, uh, one of my own mentors, Felipe Hinojosa, um, who I am now blanking on the name of the book, but um, he he write, he writes a book about how the Young Lords and others actually use religious institutions as the opportunity to create these spaces. And a lot of these activists in the 60s and 70s that did have the religious angle began using uh, from the Black Power, the, the Black Manifesto, which I, I'm forgetting the name of the author, who was a, he was a religious leader. Um, uh, is it James Cole? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't wanna say yeah and then like get it wrong, but uh, yeah, so, he definitely talks a lot about how the Black Panther Party also influences the Young Lords. And I'm really ashamed that I can't remember the name of it. And if Felipe is here, I apologize. Um, he could but, drop it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a, it's a 2021 book. Um, so it's, it's really recent. Um, and then there's also Joanna Fernandez's recent, uh, it, it's like about a 400, 500 page book about the Young Lords. And it really weaves in and out of uh, Black Panther history, as well as Young Lord's history. Um, and she does a lot of work about free, uh, to free uh, Mumia, who, uh, who's in jail here in Pennsylvania currently. And so there's definitely a, a lot of rich scholarship, I would say. Um, there's also a new uh, edited volume coming out, what I think is in the next couple months, that is called uh, Civil Rights in Black and Brown, uh, which is uh, I'll drop it in the chat because it's not even out yet. Um, and yeah, we can definitely send a book list. I can definitely be in touch with Kalanji about it. Um, but this edited volume is based on that oral history project that I mentioned. And there's a lot of young scholars, uh, both Black and Latino scholars that have published different chapters in here. Uh, my, my colleague, Catherine Bynum, writes about um, how black and brown activists organized around police brutality in Dallas in the 60s. Um, there's other scholars in there like Jasmine Howard, who is a, a colleague of ours from Michigan State, who also, so every chapter writes about these black and, black and brown coalitions. It, it does pertain to, to Texas, but I'm sure that the book will have a lot of footnotes and a lot of things to mine as far as um, that, that older scholarship that we're all building on. And then the last one I'll mention is uh, Lauren Ariasa, who wrote a book about the Black Panthers and the United Farm Workers um, and how, well, not just the Black Panthers, but the Black Power Movement and their support of the United Farm Workers. So each chapter focuses on a different Black Power Movement organization and or the Black, uh, Black Civil Rights Organization and how they supported um, in solidarity, the, the great boycotters um, all around the country. Awesome, awesome. Now, and you've discussed electoral politics, mm -hmm. so we will, in a historical context, so we won't have to revisit that. I'm curious about uh, your feeling on the potential uh, or strategies within ethnic studies, within the academy, and within the larger body politic of uh, increased black and brown uh, concerted political action. Yeah. I know that's a tough question, man. <laughs> that's, all, that's the question that has, every historian expects, but also it's like, we always, <laughs> we always cop out, right? Where it's like, well, I don't know, I'm a historian. <laughs> but, um, I think definitely, I think looking towards these cities, right, like North Carolina, um, also places like Pittsburgh, there is, uh, there's now mass waves of Central American migrants to upper, the, the upper Northeast, um, also arriving here in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, a lot of the workers around my apartment complex, they're, they're Guatemalan. Um, and like I, I've been able to speak with them about, you know, well, what brought you to Pittsburgh? And many of them are like job opportunities. So these new destinations, essentially, um, I think it's gonna be important to look at for the reasons of politics, right? I, I, oftentimes we think of politics on the national scale, right? Presidential elections every four years, congressional positions every two years, but 
the reason why the new right in the 70s and 80s was able to pick up steam and end up having the election of Ronald Reagan right is they're winning local school board elections. They're winning local district elections that then can lead to minor incremental changes that eventually gets magnified, right, by the election of Reagan in 80 and 84. Um, and so I think politics in one way to look there, um, because I don't know how much we have black and brown local politicians uh, fighting for school board elections. I think right now that's an interesting conversation point. Um, I think also the work of uh, Geraldo Cadava, who wrote a book called Hispanic Republican is, is gonna be important for us to think moving forward because much like there is black conservatives, there is a lot of Latino conservatives as well. Um, the Republican party normally banks on anywhere from 30 to 35% every election from Latinos. And so um, even on national scale politics, it's a little unknown moving forward how we are going to see these, these elections happening. But I, I go back to uh, Jennifer Jones and her work in North Carolina. Um, she's a scholar at the University of Illinois Chicago, but her new work is trying to link these conversations between abolish ICE and abolishing the police because the policing seems to be one of these important uh, intersecting points of these coalitions in the present moment and historically, right? Um, so I, yeah, it's one of those hard things moving forward knowing um, because I do think there is a lot of still fear of, you know, these uh, schism, the, the trying to turn these communities against one another, right? So solidarity is not easy. It's often mm -hmm. social movements as well are often ugly and messy and you know, there's intersections and then there's also, you know, fights and splits yeah. and everything. Um, but I would say definitely there. And then uh, I had something else I wanted to mention, but I, I'm losing it right now. But but that local organizing, that local politics is important. That's one of the key takeaways I've always had from the Black Power and, Black, and Brown Power movements was that local independent political organizing. Mm -hmm. Right. I think uh, there are some policies like a head start and et cetera that are long lasting. But I think in regards to uh, ideology and strategy, I think that lasting legacy is that independent political organizing, something that people don't think we can do in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, as I exclaim uh, many times that we, 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 we shouldn't just allow ourselves to accept we have to choose between these two options. We have to create third, fourth, fifth options. And people don't believe this possible And I say, but see, when you study history and recent history, is I would consider these movements recent history. Uh, you know, we have these examples. We have these case studies. We have these models, right? That achieve success in different places like Detroit uh, for the, 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 the election of Coleman Young and the election uh, as mayor, first black mayor of Detroit, the election of John Conyers uh, in, in, to, to Congress. Those are results of those localized uh, 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 organizing with solidarity with white working class, with uh, Middle Eastern and Persian immigrants, and uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, Salvadorans from El Salvador, right? We call it Mexican town, but it's really El Salvador. Salvadorans who are, who live there in in our practicality, right? And and to even think about this question a little more, and to also problematize it a little bit, right? Because I think sometimes too, you know, a, a a black face or a brown face in a in a you know position of power doesn't necessarily mean progressive change. Um, I think from I'm, I'm originally from like the East LA South LA area, um, little city called Southgate that is right near South Central and. You know, we have a lot of examples of corrupt, politi corrupt politics and, you know, that's the, that's the machine though, right, in a lot of ways. But um, I also think of what's going on right now with uh, Jeff Chang. Uh, he's a, a hip hop scholar, but he just wrote a book called We Gonna Be All Right, probably about two or three years ago, using the Kendrick Lamar quote, right? But what he's talking about is resegregation is happening in our communities as well as, you know, as a part of this gentrification process. Um, which I think that's an important conversation that mm -hmm. black and brown activists in a lot of ways saved so many cities that during white flight, right? When you have New York City that's crumbling in the seventies and eighties that almost, you know, files bankruptcy, right? 
You have um, other examples in Chicago or in Dallas or in Los Angeles or in San Francisco where these communities came in and, you know, taxes and businesses and everything actually save these locations. But right now what we're seeing is that even suburbs are segregated now where after white flight happens with suburbanization, once black and brown middle-class folks were able to get out to the suburbs, they're still segregated in the suburbs. But now a lot of people are moving back into the cities, right? And so we have examples in the Mission District in San Francisco that used to be a black brown space where now, you know, the artists and everybody there can't even live there anymore because, you know, Silicon Valley and wages and all that, that these apartments are, you know, K through 12 teachers can't live in the districts where they're teaching anymore. Um, so that's, I think, another point to think about for the future as far as like, where are African American and Latino immigrants and citizens going to live and how are they going to still shape our, our cities and all that? And you mentioned something, and it's something that I emphasize in my history of hip hop course is the, the strong contributions. They are equal founders of hip hop, Puerto Rican kids in, in, in New York, in, in the Bronx and the other boroughs, but in the Bronx, right? But then we could go further back, right? So what we think of, when I teach about the new Negro movement, and I have to talk about this artistic companion, right? The Harlem Renaissance. It, uh, it is littered with Afro-Latino artists. Sure. A lot of your, right, uh, the poets, the graphic artists, uh, a lot of your favorite big band music, mm -hmm. a lot of the musicians were Afro-Latino. I mean, even Desi Arnaz with I Love Lucy, right? And people didn't realize that he was practicing African spirituality on the show. Religions and uh, Santeria and Candomblé yeah. and all these religions yeah. in Cuba, yeah. right? Or throughout the Americas. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but oh, we, can, no, go we can go so many different routes with, with yeah. the, these kind of conversations besides social movements. Indeed, and that's why I get so frustrated when I see these, you know, people trying to exploit division and, and, and create otherness amongst, you know, uh, these groups when we have a longer tradition of finding commonality. And, and as you said, there's convergence, divergence. Uh, when people are comp competing uh, for limited resources or access to limited resources, of course, you know, we have ugly things happen. Intra-community things beyond just simply inter-community, you know, uh, uh, tensions and stuff. And, and it, it disheartens me. So I'm glad to hear that there are people doing the work that can help curb that. Mm -hmm. And that we have uh, young people interested in taking courses and pursuing degrees and praxis that can help uh, curb that. That is something that's very important to me. In fact, next month, uh, I'll be having Dr. Kyle Mays speak on a webinar about his <laughs> research on Afro indigenous experience, because I'm seeing that same BS happening in regards to these kooks and cons promoting these falsehoods that is creating divides between uh, indigenous American and uh, Afro descent, African descendant communities in America, in the Americas. And it's, it's, it's extremely problematic and it's gonna lead, if it's not checked, it's gonna lead to further catastrophe uh, and, and it won't help anyone at all. Yeah, and I, and I think to also extend your the conversation about the Harlem Renaissance um, in the 60s and 70s, you have others, right, like Mary Baraka and, and others who are in the Black Arts Movement. And but you have, you know, the Last Poets, which were are this legendary poetry group that eventually Felipe Luciano, who's a Latino, an Afro Latino, he becomes one of the Last Poets, and Luciano actually ends up being a key leader in the Young Lords Party as well. And so culture definitely, um, I, I like to talk about hip hop a lot too. My dream is to teach a hip hop history course. I'm currently teaching pop culture, but okay. you know, it, it's allowed me to also look at the cultural avenues for these intersections. And also if there's anybody in the audience that likes like reggaeton or like Bad Bunny or some of, or J Balvin or some of these, you know, okay. reggaeton artists, there is a lot of whitewashing of even reggaeton history that ignores some of the Afro, early Afro-Dominican Afro and Afro-Puerto Rican pioneers, essentially, 
from the 90s and, and the early 2000s. And so I think that's something we had to keep problematizing and calling things out when we see them. And I know one of the questions is uh, thinking about teaching these ethnic issues and history to students at the elementary level. And I think that's the that's that's a hard question, I think, in our current political climate, right? With the discussions of critical race theory, which, you know, is a it's more a legal term, but now we're kind of using it as a kind of catch-all for racial histories um, in K through 16 education, right? And so um, I think one way is there, there's a lot of recent um, kids literature that focuses on whether it's African-American issues or Latino issues. And, and when we send out an email with kind of a, a reading list, I can definitely include some, but one that comes to mind and some folks might not agree, right? But uh, Ibram Kennedy's work with, uh, he's got a lot of children's books coming out right now that um, are you know on the theme of how to be an anti-racist. And so it is a, a difficult conversation because I think it's one, how do we convince parents to you know, be okay with this teaching at the K through 12 level? Um, and then how to also convince, right, state and local curriculum or, or testing, because that I think is still a persistent issue that, you know, those cultural questions don't appear in standardized testing oftentimes, which does create, you know, sometimes a, a knowledge kind of barrier for students that aren't seeing themselves represented in the curriculum still as far as, you know, even if it's math questions, right, and there's still a lot of problematic math questions that are around. The, I know that there's a lot of recent history of, you know, questions equating to slavery, talking about, you know, asking questions of like, if X person owned this many people, like, or whatever. So I think just trying to hopefully be able to teach away from the, the standards. And this is the, the, the hard part with, with state testing, right? That you have to, sometimes you have to teach. My, my brother is a, he's a K through five teacher. And a lot of times he's always talking about, right? Like, well, I have to teach by the book. I have to teach, you know. Um, I think trying to get away from, in California, we grew up uh, creating Spanish missions, which, you know, you had, to, you had to have the popsicles and you would create like the Santa Barbara mission and others, but we didn't get that history of colonization essentially, or of, you know, manifest destiny. And so trying to think about how to talk about it in a, in an easier way, I think is, is the hard question. Um, because yeah, how do you talk to someone that's in K through five about Columbus, not just as the explorer, but Columbus as, you know. The genocidal maniac. Yeah, symbol and, and you know, a person that has led to that. So. You can say it, I'll say it for you. <laughs> I'll let, I'll, I'll let. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but I, I think that there is a lot of um, kids literature and there's some databases now that are being created that are focused on uh, African-American histories for K through, 12, uh, K through five kids, as well as um, Latino focused ones. So I, I don't know many of them at the top of my name, but I could definitely do a little research and, and kind of get back to sending some resources. Indeed, and, and, and it is tough because I often talk with folk and I say, you know, at what age would I would have wanted them to approach in school teaching my son about slavery? I know at what age I taught it to him at home and at home is a controlled environment. And to some extent, I, I have expertise, right? That's, you know, one of my subfields. So I have an advantage or had an advantage over uh, most other parents. Uh, but at what point, right? And, and, and at what age, would it be appropriate in K through 12 education to they introduce the horrors of slavery on these various plantations in the Americas, you know, depending on, uh, uh, varied by gender, age, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, th those are, you know, tough questions. And, and we have to be honest, and we can't allow folks who are paid to be talking heads on television that say the bazingas and got you statements. You know, we as professionals, we as historians, to be honest, and other educators, but you and I particularly as historians, most of our students we teach are going to be K through 12 social studies teachers. Right. You see, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really an important consideration for us because we teach the teachers mm -hmm. uh, content. Uh, in that regard. So they're often equipped with it, but the struggle is where 
and at what age would it be appropriate? Uh, and my sister too is a elementary school teacher and she expresses the same challenges of, hey, we got these standardized tests. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, not only, you know, it, it is my job and or a raise connected to their performance on these standardized tests, but their actual diplomas being certified or not are connected to these standardized tests. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough challenge. Yeah. And one thing I'll say like pedagogically is, and I don't think we all know that there's these teachers out there that do this. I'm not saying that you and I, right. But definitely I think through the, the K through 16 level of not pointing or not focusing the attention of a conversation on, you know, if there is a, a student of color in the class in a, maybe perhaps in a, you know, mixed class setting that, you know, that they should be, carry the burden, right, to, you know, be the representative of their culture, be the representative of their history, um, which I don't think that's so much the case now. I, I would hope not, but, you know, in the 60s and 70s and, you know, all throughout the 20th century, that was a case, right, of using someone as the example to have these conversations. So really trying to not put the spotlight, especially on, on K through five children, right, to deal with that burden, to carry their own, you know, families, histories, uh, to be a, a, a teaching point for the other kids, I think is important. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause my father waited till I was 12 to tell me that the Buffalo soldiers weren't heroes. <laughs> so he let me in black history month, my first couple of years of elementary school, tell him, tell my classmates about this book. I read about the Buffalo soldiers. And I asked him later in life why he waited so long. And he said, he just wasn't sure I would understand it until I got to that age, that complexity of they were doing these things and it was good for them and allowed to demonstrate you know, uh, citizenship, manhood, and all this. But then in order to do that, they were inflicting harm on these Plains people, these indigenous people, and these things that they were doing to them. And, you know, that 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 made sense to me when I got older. Uh, Dr. Patterson posed the question, how can we support today's revolutionary, uh, and I'm assuming revolutionary spirit or revolutionary ideas, and still keep our jobs? This has been a great conversation. Uh, I, that's a tough question, uh, but I, and I'll let uh, Dr. Benia respond. But I know for me, I I hope that by rooting and grounding my my uh, pedagogy and my my uh, lectures and uh, my content in truth uh, and and present uh, the mainstream narrative, the counter narrative, and then even other. Uh, competing narratives and put them in conversation and allow the students to 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 digest it and, and maybe come to some of their own conclusions. I hope that will protect you know us uh, from being in the position from possibly losing our jobs. And then even in regard to programming like this and campus presentations and campus appear uh, appearances, I, I hope that rooting it in truth and maybe this even goes to the uh, other question about, you know, and what ways can we approach this? Uh, we definitely need to root it in primary sources, I, I would think, uh, and, and that doesn't even have to be historical today, uh, and presenting their voices, being a conduit of presenting their voices, uh, that may, but I mean, that's a tough question. Uh, but go ahead, Dr. Benin. Yeah, I'll take the, the supporting part outside of the campus, right, where I think one is listening and uh, really, I should say, really listening to Black women leaders. Um, I think when we look at Black Lives Matter in Ferguson or we look at just movements across the board, it is a lot of Black women that are leading these movements. And also resources is a, is a big one. This is Money goes a long ways for many of these grassroots organizations, even if it's five dollars or ten dollars. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of activists like to talk about right that that one latte that you're going to have, like that can go a long way. Now, I say that as someone that you know purchases the latte here or there. I think Kalanji will remember, like I was at the 
I was at our, our local coffee shop basically every morning. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that that is another way is that, you know, also speaking just to, just listening to these organizations, I think is very important because I, I do think a lot of our peers perhaps are kind of like, oh, they're just a spewing, right? These like, you know, radical notions that are going to shape our own personal lives, right? The individual part of how we all operate in, in our world, right? Most of us, all of us basically operate individualistically, collectively as well, but with families and everything. And I think families is another starting point. Um, I'll speak from my own personal experience. Um, there is a lot of anti-Blackness in my own family that it is a difficult conversation to tell my mom, right? Or a family member that perhaps has these certain thoughts, you know, that go a long way, 40 years, 50 years um, of both anti-Indigenous perspectives and anti-Blackness, because that's how deep rooted this is, right? That we are growing up, some, some people, we, uh, many of us, right, are growing up with these ideas and these notions because of our education system and also our, the way we socialize. Um, so having those difficult conversations, I think is a, it's not as a radical act of, you know, being public or having public support for things, but just trying to do those daily incremental changes. Um, and then the last part that I'll, that I'll say is that many of these organizations, of course, need volunteers and need help and, you know, numbers matter, I think, Dr. Walton was talking about, right, just mass community organizing and, you know, a mass, a critical mass requires many folks. Um, but I, I have personal experience with, with certain groups that needed a historian to help them archive and document their histories. And so that is one way is how can we lend our resources that we learn or have in the communities? Um, same thing with the, uh, the activist group I write about, they're all collecting oral histories and publishing them online and, and talking about these silences in the archives if we want to take the academic route where, you know, we don't know a lot about black and brown radicals because of the FBI, right? Because many of them had to operate underground. Um, they had to not have names attached to their documents. So any way we can help. And I think Arturo Schomburg is a, a key person that we can look for, right? That the Schomburg Research Center exists still in Harlem and it is the Mecca, right? Of black research and Afro-Latinx research as well. So trying to even create institutional changes, whether it's at our, our institutional libraries to try to collect different types of resources. And so there's, I think a, a lot we can do that besides being on the front lines and you know having the bullhorn in our hand, because I do think in a lot of ways as academics, we have to understand that we, when we enter those spaces, even if we study these histories, we're not on the ground as much as perhaps the, the younger generations are that are, are envisioning our future, right? That, they are the leaders. And I think also being open to multi-generational dialogue. Uh, I think a lot of times the elders or the OGs or the veterans, right? Can It's easy for them to say like, you know, we did it differently. Like what you guys are doing is wrong. And I think that does kind of at, at some points can end communication there versus, you know, some of the younger generations also too, right? Are, are calling their old, their elders, you know, dinosaurs or, you know, like, you guys didn't succeed so like why should we even listen to you and so many of the activists I write about they have created their own community centers they have created they continued working in a group known as the Chinese Progressive Association where they are working with younger generations so I think there's ways to do that and conversations whether it's lecture talks or you know just trying to open up these histories to folks because like we've been mentioning, right? We didn't hear these things in our K through 12 education, but perhaps um, this can be useful. And also political education is important to all of these movements. All of the activists we've been talking about, even if they weren't perhaps on the college campus, they still had study groups. And so even lending ourselves to contextualize some of those readings can, can go a long way. Um, because in social movement history, I think that's important that we learn from both the lessons and the failures and the failures are lessons as well, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think there's just a, a host of ways that we can do stuff that perhaps is hopefully doesn't jeopardize anybody's positions. And, and to be truthful, that was the initial mission and thrust for Black Studies and Chicano Studies was for people like you and I to 
take that information back to the community and provide it to them open access without cost and then uh provide our scholarship or make our scholarship accessible as well because that's one of the challenges uh is these, these paywalls right? right you know uh my mom unless i xerox it and mail it to her when my article does come out over the next couple months in the journal african american history she's not going to have access to it so i know the little me who is 14 years old in some small town in the midwest like i was right <clears throat> seeking this information interested in this information they won't have access to it so we have to also bring it to the community and that's one of the charges to bring it back full circle yeah. of the thrust of and what those students and youth wanted and wanted us to do if they could peer to the future they'd say we want you guys to be in the community and provide this information and make it accessible i always say uh, and that's why I, I often don't talk in big fancy words i mean i can i mean I, I have to write in it sometimes right but my philosophy is if my mother doesn't understand what i'm saying then who am i really talking to right you know yeah and and just to piggyback off that that was exactly what i was going to say is that um, in a lot of ways, the way historians write, um, because we do, in a lot of ways, folks have to write for tenure and promotion, right? So sometimes public history isn't considered as what's the word, like not valuable, but you know, it, it doesn't merit. It doesn't merit the same way as like perhaps a, a journal article, because that's the challenge, right? We do have to speak both to the academic audience, but how also, and I think there's a lot of great public history programs and things like podcasts now and uh, virtual mapping websites that are a, a lot more accessible. And some of them are really attentive to local histories. Um, I already mentioned one, the civil rights in brown and black, um, but also just the way that we write for public facing audiences. I think it's the way that our discipline can also continue thriving and living because in a lot of ways our discipline is disconnected, right? From these communities. And so I think if we really want to be useful to, to movement activists, it's to shift our, try to shift our writing, right? To this more public <laughs> uh, type of work. Indeed, indeed. Uh, a student put a question into the chat, not the Q and A, uh, but she asked, is the new generation able to organize and act on the change in the same or more radical ways from 50 years ago? If so, is, uh, what's the best way to keep the momentum of radical change going beyond temporary solutions? Another tough question. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's at the heart of social movement history, I think, is with student activism, uh, that's just to speak to one kind of venue, is that you run into the issue of, you know, kids graduate, people graduate and move on. And then a new class of students arrive to campus, right? So it's kind of like, starting all over again, which is a challenge. Um, another cha challenge is the conditions of which social movements arise. So we brought a little bit up about Pro and FBI that a lot of times it isn't that the movements fizzle, right? It is that there is conditions that cause these movements to fissure, whether it's Pro and the assassination of Fred Hampton, right? Um, Judas and the Black Messiah gets at this, that the government has been fearing you know, radicals since the turn of the century. Um, Sharice Bird and Sully, who's one of my new favorite scholars, um, she writes a lot about um, how Black activists, right, like Claudia Jones and others were targeted by W.B. Du Bois and others were targeted by the state, um, by McCarthyism, right, which was a movement that not only attacked national leaders, but it trickled down all the way through local teachers, K through five, K through 12. Janitors at Dodge, Maine for my case study, League of Revolutionary Black Workers, exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, we, we face different conditions today, um, but we face similar ones as well. The, yeah. uh, the way I teach social movement history it is that it is the, I don't wanna use the word dialectical, so I use the word relationship between okay policing and activists where oftentimes policing causes new forms of activism to arise. We look at the Black Lives Matter movement, right? The, the various cases um, that led to this national movement, now a global movement as well, um, stems from, from policing. 
but then also movement activists were able to create these new movements. And now the FBI and policing has created new surveillance tactics. Um, Dr. Ashley Farmar, who has a great book about black power women in different black power organizations. She has a, a public facing article that talks about how the FBI used one woman's Etsy account because a, a, a movement activist, because now we have all the surveillance stuff, right? With cameras and videos and everything that she was at a Black Lives Matter protest. She was wearing a special t-shirt and they were able to track which account she bought the special t-shirt from her Etsy. And then from her Etsy, they found her Instagram. And then from Instagram, they were able to find who she was and they ultimately took her to jail. Um, so that's one thing I want to first kind of lay out that, you know, these movements are often brushing up against the fiercest forms of policing and infiltration. Um, there's historical examples of this. And then I think one way to move, keep the movement forward is thinking about, you know, that the, the losses are always going to amount. There's a, oftentimes a lot more, you know, losing, whether it's, you know, trying to push President Biden to the left, which a lot of activists thought would be able to be possible, which I think we're seeing that it hasn't been as much the case as folks were advocating, um, is that, you know, perhaps not winning this battle, but being ready for the next one. So that's a part of social movement history as well, that, you know, the folks that are, have been in the game a long time, you know, even if they lost, they, they, they were able to gain new strategies, right? They were able to learn, you know, all right, door to door didn't work during this campaign. Perhaps we need to try something different to reach, you know, new activists. And so, um, I think not getting discouraged by, you know, change takes a very long time. It's not going to happen, you know, tomorrow. It might not happen next month. It might not happen next year. Um, so having that mental aspect that, you know, you're still going to show up and you're still going to struggle because it, it might happen, you know, in the next two years. And it might not happen for our generation, right? It might happen for the generation's five, you know, 50 years down the line, the way that with ethnic studies, like we are here again, right? Because of what people did 60 years ago. So that's kind of one, a major thing I would say is not being discouraged. Um, if the movement, you know, perhaps stutters or isn't um, gaining ground, because even with Black Lives Matter, we see that, you know, it has reached high points and it's also fizzled a little bit, but also it, it has created some changes. Um, whether it was whether right now the rhetorical changes about you know the funding or you know allocating police resources somewhere else, which a lot of cities right like Minnesota and others are backing away from now, um, is that we just keep our our keep our fingers on the button and, and hope to keep pushing these politicians and others further um, and not being complacent with some of these early wins and also keeping on on struggling. I, I think that was a great answer, and I agree. I agree, and I think uh, focusing in on or being mindful, always being aware, and I will, I do want to use the word focusing in on on policy, right? Because that is something that can outlive you. And if we're talking specifically, like for students at an institution, K through twelve, or uh, secondary education, right, or higher ed. Uh, you know, your time, you, we're transient, students are transient, right? But policy can <laughs> outlive you, right? And, and, and focusing on policy and policy ideas. Now your policies may not become, pol your policy recommendations may not become policies, but it can help keep momentum and it can help drive the conversation and it can lead to uh, some change. And I, I think people can't underestimate the notion of just, just organizing and, and mentoring within intra, intra, you know, uh, group or movement uh, mentoring, right? My thing has always been, you know, because one complaint, I'm sure you may have heard it in the, in, in the Latino and the Chicano community, uh, in the Latinx or Chicano community, right? oh, another organization, another organization. We hear it in the black community all the time, but my perspective is we can never have enough organizations. As long as we have people who are not in the organization, then possibly an organization for them hasn't been created yet, right? And that's a way to organize people to uh, uh, and, and and raise consciousness, right? Because that's that's the key. And we talked about culture, and culture plays a huge role in that. 
And I would encourage the young people, y'all have to be more deliberate and selective in what y'all promote culturally with your money. Because we, we, we y'all really, the young people really, really, really do because it's a direct correlation to consciousness, right? We often say it's old focus and I'm older than you and we talk about rap music an awful lot, <laughs> right? But you know, part of my consciousness definitely came from the type of music I was listening to, right? And I won't even get into the rock and the punk rock I was listening to. I'll just keep it to hip hop. But you know, it was a, it was a different type of consciousness. And it is definitely not like the consciousness that I see in hip hop in 2021. And I think it's reflective in many ways. Uh, I feel that. like you're baiting me on this one. Oh, no, I'm not baiting you. <laughs> no, no, no. no because I'm going to scold on Jay-Z. <laughs> if you go no, bait uh, me. <laughs> no, because I, I would push a little bit back just as far as, you know, what perhaps didn't work for the previous generation might work for the next generation, right? But Mm -hmm. hip-hop in a lot of ways is like social movements where we do get these cross-generational conversations which a lot of times we can you know end the conversation at one thing right where it's like yeah. Tupac versus like Kendrick Lamar right and it's kind of like for me it's like also the comparison in sports too right like everybody like Kobe's got to be compared to Michael Jordan and so yeah. we always have to compare same thing with activists right comparing activists from generations but um finding those pockets, even in the present, because I, I listen to everything, right? I listen to 90s, 80s, I have older brothers, so I was put on game pretty early, but, you know, also finding in, in other, like I'll use Kendrick Lamar as an example, because that's some of who I came up with, but, you know, some of his political, politi political takes have been important as movement calls, right? The Black Lives Matter movement, there's countless videos across the country of chants of we gonna be all right, right? Um, so there is some pockets. I, I'll agree with you, right? That it's not uh, over. It's not the. It's not the majority anymore. Um, and I think you're right that the how we support certain artists, um, especially with our money and you know retweets and everything and social and social media is a whole other component. I think mm. to talk about with movement building as far as you know sometimes it is easy for us to sit on our computers and retweet something and think we were you know doing change for the day. Um, versus like hitting the ground with our boots and, and you know, whether it's at a protest, whether it's, you know, donating our funds to these organizations. Um, it is easy for us to, you know, like a tweet or like a, a Instagram post. And, and on the flip end, social media has helped a lot as well to promote these things, right? The, the reason why we have the Black Lives Matter movement is that a lot of these killings were happening on video camera that perhaps you know, activism in the 60s and 70s, it might have been more word of mouth, but police, again, police brutality is kind of a through line. And, yeah. but now we have those, it, something can go viral, right, in a second and really enrage someone to, to take action. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think definitely um, moving forward, I think we're going to see that a lot of active, a lot of artists did get shaped a little bit by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, how much that's going to continue moving forward, it, it's hard to tell, but Hey, so when Little Baby made that great song, I was like, the, the potential is there. Right. Right. I was like, man, okay, it's there. It's there. And I want to say this. I'm proud of the young people because I believe this generation of young people, and I, it's my positionality perhaps, and I could have a skewed view because I spent most of my life on the university campus. Mm -hmm. But these young people, and it's demonstrated by their use of uh platforms like youtube and etc they are thirsting and seeking the knowledge far greater than i think my generation did to be quite honest with you and and, and it's a good thing it's an extremely good thing there's dangers there because you got the con artists and the clowns and the fools on youtube that's tom tell you some ridiculous stuff and then ask you for five dollars like dan calloway and all those other boneheads I'm just being honest, but nonetheless, but this, they, they're, they're, they're really, really eager and, and seeking the knowledge and older people like me have to recognize that they in, absorb knowledge in, from different platforms and in different ways that my generation didn't have access to. I often talk bad about them. Y'all ain't picked up a book, y'all watching YouTube, uh, but the skill that they could develop and I can help them with that and I try to is being able to discern what is a credible presenter, you know, and if getting to the information is the key, uh, 
then you know, however you get to the information should be uh, respected and, and, and promoted and championed in that regard. No, and, and I think um, the, the approach I take in the classroom is that I'm learning as much from students as I'm hopefully being able to convey to them as well, where you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that perhaps weren't in my syllabi five years ago, um, or perhaps weren't in my professor's syllabi 20 years ago, I don't know about 20, uh, like 10, 15 years ago. 15, but I was about to say, don't it's get getting it. up there now. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, things around gender and sexuality and, and, you know, these things that we need to be open to, um, much like we have to press our parents, uh, perhaps from their generations, right, from the 60s or 70s or, or the 80s, is that, these younger activists are really changing our language, the way that we speak to one another. And I think there's really a lot of importance to think about, particularly from people of color and particularly from the LGBT plus community of how we construct our syllabi, how we teach these histories. And so I think there has to be a lot of back and forth um, in that kind of, in that process. And, and I know we both do it, but also I think just for all of us to be doing that, right? To try to, because generation is a part of our intersectional identities, right? Whether it's sex, gender, class, race, it's culture, et cetera. Um, generation is important, the age is, is important there as well. And so trying to be cognizant of that, of how we, we need to have that dialogue, right? To, Cause that also interrupts a lot of movements sometimes too, that some folks get burned out and they're like, I'm done, I'm over this. Like I no longer want to, but then there's other folks that take that back seat, but are also still in the car, right? To use like a metaphor that, you know, they didn't leave the car, they're, they're taking the back seat and letting the younger folk determine, right? Again, I go back to environmental justice activism that a lot of us won't be here when, you know, the, the climate scientists are saying X things are gonna happen, but our kids or, our, you know, our friends' kids, our friends' kids' kids, you know, are so they're leading the charge and I'm willing to take the back seat and listen to them, right? Indeed. Well, I want to say thank you. We could go on and on and on. It's and we, been a while. <laughs> yes, I, indeed, indeed. We could go on and on just about catching up. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, uh, but we're close to the close. I, I want to say uh, thank you on behalf of uh, the Global Black Studies Program, uh, Intercultural Affairs, and Dr. Patterson is the Director of Intercultural Affairs, uh, and the Latinx Studies Program, and the Western Carolina community as a whole. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going. I'm going to send you an email because we want to give you a, a gift, an honorarium for your time and expertise. Uh, so, but we're so grateful and so thankful to have you come and speak with us and share this information. And this is a step to, 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 to show that solidarity and create them spaces to have these conversations. Uh, and that's why I had this for Hispanic Heritage Month. And then lastly, I wanna also thank uh, our, uh, our, our Vice President of uh, Diversity and Equity, Ricardo is an awesome man and, and he helps pull things together as well. He's a proud Puerto Rican guy. <laughs> and he makes sure everyone knows <laughs> no, and, and just thank you for having me i, I really appreciate it and everyone in attendance uh, just sharing space with y'all has been has been great tonight and hopefully you know please don't i put my email in the chat please don't hesitate and i'll definitely send dr walton some books to send out to the to the email server if, if there is one awesome awesome well thank you again and i'll uh send you an email following up about paperwork I need from you to get your gift to you. <laughs> cool. Sounds great, Dr. Watson. Awesome. Everyone have a good have, night. <laughs> everyone have a good night and thank you all for joining us.